Welcome to module two of the series entitled Diagnosis of Early Alzheimer's Disease versus Mild Cognitive Impairment. My name is Dr. Mark DeGronin. I'm a geriatric psychiatrist and I'm the Senior Vice President for Behavioral Health at Miami Jewish Health in Miami, Florida. I'm also the Chief Medical Officer for Mind Institute at Miami Jewish Health, uh, also located in Miami, our Memory Disorder Center. I'm joined uh, again with my friend and colleague, Dr. Richard Isaacson. He's the director of the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic and also an associate professor of neurology and the assistant dean for faculty development at Weill Cornell Medicine and New York Presbyterian in New York City. So Richard, welcome. Good to have you for the next module. Great, uh, thanks so much. Absolutely. Uh, faculty disclosure is I do some consulting for both Biogen and Eli Lilly. Dr. Isaacson does not have any specific disclosures. Uh, the program is provided by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, which is an HMP company, and it's supported by an educational grant from Biogen. Uh, in terms of learning objectives for Module 2, we will focus on ways to identify symptoms of early Alzheimer's disease compared with mild cognitive impairment, and we'll talk about all the different available tools you can utilize for early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So... Let's talk first about how do we know someone has a major neurocognitive disorder? How do we know it's Alzheimer's disease versus some other type? Mm -hmm. So our base is always a comprehensive evaluation. And we recommend that this is conducted by someone who's a specialist, a neurologist, a geriatric psychiatrist, a geriatrician, but someone who really knows all the components here. It begins with a thorough mental status examination after you take a good history. You want to know what's the story, what's changed over time, how are they different from their baseline? And then when you do the mental status examination, you really can begin to gather that data to see how are they performing in the office? Uh, how are they able to have a conversation, describe things, do they have insight into it? How do they present? We always include a brief cognitive screen, which we'll detail, but this is uh, an instrument which is not gonna necessarily make a diagnosis. It's gonna tell you in, in a general way, how is their cognitive function? We always want to make sure they have a thorough physical and neurological examination. Uh, there's so much to look at, but I would focus on in particular, how does a person walk? Are there any, abno any abnormal movements? Is there anything uh, that's really overt that could be a factor in, in what's going on in terms of their brain function? Basic labs would include thyroid function, complete blood count, electrolytes, liver function. We also get vitamin B12 and folate, not necessarily because they're common causes of dementia, but we want to get any obvious factors that, well, well, maybe they're not causing the cognitive changes. They certainly could be exacerbating the changes. Mm -hmm. Someone who we have added suspicion, maybe they have unusual symptoms, they're, they're young, they're, they're, there's something about the case that doesn't meet the eye, we might want to do some more extensive testing, maybe a Lyme titer, if there's a potential tick exposure, uh, we might want to do an analysis of cerebral spinal fluid. So that's going to be dictated by the history. Always get a brain scan. This is important. We want to rule out any major anatomical causes of what's going on. The brain scan might not make the diagnosis, but it's certainly going to tell us if there's stroke or tumors or something or a bleed that could be having an impact here. If, if uh, someone comes into an ER, typically they do a CT scan because it's quicker. It's usually done after some trauma. Uh, if you can't do an MRI for whatever reason, but in general, an MRI is going to give you a, a better picture. You're going to be able to identify smaller infarcts, the white matter changes. So that's always ultimately the go-to scan we're able to. Also today, we have the advantage of different type of PET scans, either that assess function, such as using fluorodeoxyglucose, which is a basically a radioactive form of, of a sugar solution that's going to tell us how the brain is functioning in real time. We also have different uh, dyes with uh, radioisotope labels that can identify beta amyloid plaques and now tau protein. So those PET scans are really becoming more important. And finally, neuropsychological testing is one of our gold standards because it talks about across all the different important cognitive domains, what sort of changes we're seeing uh, in terms of language function, executive function, visual spatial, all the really important components of trying to make this diagnosis, both in terms of the uh, degree of impairment and the different types of impairment. 
Great. And, you know, when it comes to the cognitive screen, um, there's a lot of, um, there, I guess I would say there's a lack of consensus. Maybe that's a good way to put it about what is the best way to screen someone for cognitive uh, changes. And while I, I don't think I have the best answer by any means, I think anyone um, can at least try something. Um, and whether uh, you're in primary care or whether you're a subspecialist, uh, you're going to choose different tests and that's okay. Uh, but, you know, a basic screening test, it's, it's um, you know, we all know it because we've all learned it, but the mini mental status exam at least we'll give some general degree of, of, of performance. Uh, the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, is something that um, is honestly used even a little bit more so now than the Mini Mental. Um, it's more difficult than Mini Mental. It's, uh, you really need um, good uh, executive function or adequate executive function to get through it. It takes a little bit longer, but it gives you uh, just a little bit more uh, dialed in accuracy when it comes to um, cognitive impairment related to a neurodegenerative dementia, like Alzheimer's disease. Um, there's the slums, which is similar to the MOCA in some ways. Um, and then there's the MINICOG. The MINICOG actually, if you have minimal time at all, uh, the MINICOG is, is, is pretty good. It's, it's literally a three word recall and a clock draw. That's all it is. So if, uh, you know, someone doesn't have any time and, and, and is, you know, I, I, I appreciate that when you have your boots on the ground and seeing patients and reimbursements, these are, it's tough, tough times in medicine. Um, it's not, you know, not like it used to be, I guess, in, in a lot of things, but it's, it's hard. So at least do a quick screen and a three word recall, you know, even when you're taking the vital signs, um, do the blood pressure, do the pulse, do all your stuff. And then after you're done with taking the vital signs, repeat the three words. And then at the end, uh, have the person draw a clock. And if something's wrong, um, it can at least give you some degree of sense. Maybe we need to do additional uh, cognitive testing. Definitely. And the key thing here is consistency and even training for some of these. They can seem really easy to do, but you know, someone who has a different technique than someone else in, in your clinical practice, you can be up or down several points just on the basis of that technique. Um, w when we begin to put all this information together, we're really in a different era in terms of how we think about Alzheimer's disease. In the past, it was kind of yes or no, either you had symptoms, you have Alzheimer's disease or not. Now, as we'll talk about with the advent of what we call biomarkers, so these are actual physical markers of, of pathophysiologic change in the body, we, we were able to identify people who are really in a preclinical stage of Alzheimer's disease. They, if you test them, they don't have cognitive impairment. Maybe they have some subjective impairment. They're functionally, they're doing well, but we see biomarker evidence of Alzheimer's disease in their brain. We'll detail what those are, but we're going to focus really on, on the role of amyloid and, and tau, those toxic proteins in the brain. Then there are individuals who also have that biomarker evidence, but they're showing symptoms now. They're mild symptoms. It's not necessarily having an impact on their activities of daily living. This is a prodromal state, often uh, called mild cognitive impairment of Alzheimer's disease. And finally, you have individuals who they have both biomarkers and more significant cognitive impairment. This is typically someone that you'd imagine is going to walk in, into your office. They're have, having functional impairment. It's so important we're appreciating these different stages because obviously by the time someone comes in and they have more significant symptoms, uh, well, maybe it's at least at this stage too little too late to really have a significant impact. So the bottom line is that we're trying to find ways to, to, to improve treatment at that point. We'll talk about it in later modules. But if we can identify people much earlier along in the course and intervene at that point, that might make all the difference in terms of their overall course. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. And the earlier you treat, honestly, I believe, um, you know, from my clinical experience anyway, you know, the better a person will do. They'll be able to get educated, get informed, get the support structures in place. Um, and when it comes to mild cognitive impairment, um, I think, you know, that's really, you know, a, a really, you know, important window of opportunity for intervention in the, in the pre-dementia stages. And, you know, what is MCI, just so we're all on the same page, mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease is when a person reports memory complaints or their loved one or family members or friends um, or observe it, their memory scores are lower than their average peers. You know, some use the, the cutoff one and a half standard deviations below the norm, uh, but their daily function is essentially normal. I have a patient, um, you know, he's still a, a, you know, a practicing accountant. He works with a group of people. He definitely has glitches, but someone definitely checks his work and he knows he needs to do that, but he's still working. He's still engaged and he's still able to keep track of things and, and do pretty well. He has what I would call very early mild cognitive impairment. And he's made, you know, adapt adaptations in his life so that he could really continue on. Um, what happens with MCI? Well, about a third or so actually revert back to normal in two to three years. And, and that's, that's an interesting uh, construct that we definitely are, are 
excited to study more because what, what is it about these cases? Is that due to Alzheimer's or is that's probably not due to Alzheimer's disease. So it's really important uh, to make these distinctions. About a third develop dementia over the next several years. And that's important. And the remaining third stay, stay about stable. So there's a, there's a difference between mild cognitive impairment as a whole, which can be caused by several different um, causes, uh, even, you know, pseudo dementia of depression. It can be caused by a, a medical disorder. It can be caused by another neurodegenerative disorder, a vascular disease, but mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease will invariably progress. Uh, and it, it progresses at different rates. Yeah. It gives us a good window to really begin intervening and, and trying to see what what direction someone is heading in. You know, now one of the big differences that we have compared to 10 years ago is these biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. So for instance, we can look for, well, in the past, the only way you really knew is you had to look at a piece of brain tissue and doing a brain biopsy is not a, something we, we like to do at all uh, unless it's absolutely necessary, but we can look for accumulation of, of uh, beta amyloid or A beta the 42 amino acid chain uh, version of it in cerebrospinal fluid. And in fact, it's interesting what happens is, is it builds up in the brain, it gets bound up in plaque, you actually see levels decrease in cere cerebrospinal fluid. And now we have PET scans where you can light it up on using a amyloid based dye. We also can look for the accumulation of phosphorylated tau also in cerebrospinal fluid where it tends to increase the cells that um, begin to be damaged and release it into the spinal fluid. But also now we have um, uh, agents that you can light it up on a tau-based PET scan. We look for loss of metabolism using uh, a PET scan that, you, that um, uses fluorodeoxyglucose, which is again, a sort of a radioactive form of uh, sugar solution. And in particular for Alzheimer's disease, we're looking for a very characteristic pattern of uh, loss of uh, metabolism, specifically in, in bilateral temporal and parietal lobes. And finally, we look for atrophy, especially disproportionate atrophy in the hippocampus and surrounding interrhinal cortex. And an MRI or an MRI that uses line metrics can do that. So what we have nowadays are these four different biomarkers that can really help us get a better diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and not just a really good educated guess based on the clinical picture. And, you know, the, these various ratios of, of biomarkers is something that is essential to truly understand what a person's chances are of, of, of having Alzheimer's dementia specifically. And we think of this as like a triplicate signature or, or you know, you need uh, both phospho tau, total tau, as well as amyloid levels. So um, this is a, a graph, um, and this is a, a, from, a, from a paperback uh, in the Annals of Neurology over a decade ago. Uh, but even the reports that you get back um, have a, a, a similar, um, you know, a paradigm where they me measure these three, they put it into um, a, a, a graph, and, and it's either consistent with Alzheimer's pathology or it's not. And normal is, is normal. And then there's unfortunately, sometimes when we get back equivocal cases and we think it could be Alzheimer's, but the results are equivocal. And these, uh, these are some of the more challenging cases where we either need to, you know, allow the tincture of time to, to, to help us uh, with, with progression. And, and that way, when someone progresses, unfortunately, at least we'll know more about what their symptomatology uh, will lead to be. But we also may need to rely on other tests and it's not super uncommon we're all even, you know, have to employ different uh, biomarker tests to truly come to some of the more challenging diagnoses. Yeah, and you, you and I both remember when, when we first started working together as patients, we, we made the best guess we could. We didn't have all these biomarkers to really yeah. make a difference today. Yeah. And especially with research, it can make all the difference. So for instance, if you want to get involved in most clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease, you have to show evidence of amyloid protein on a PET scan that's visualized here or uh, tau protein on PET scan and coming down the pike is even looking at different forms of uh, phosphorylated tau in plasma. Um, functional PET scans not only are, can be helpful for Alzheimer's disease, but especially in younger patients when you suspect a frontal temporal dementia, you, you can see uh, metabolism really dropping in frontal or temporal lobes and that can uh, give you a clue to that in addition to the clinical picture. And finally, we always want to do a structural scan. I, as I mentioned earlier, the MRI is going to be the superior scan because you're just going to see that level of detail. You're not going to see in a CT scan for the most part. Yeah. 
And when it comes to scanning, um, there's now several uh, FDA approved. This is now since honestly 2012. So it's been a while. There are now three FDA approved amyloid PET labeling agents that can be used for early diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Uh, like Dr. Gronin said, they really label the, the beta amyloid plaques in the brain. A negative scan basically shows that there are sparse or no neuritic plaques. So it's not consistent with Alzheimer's disease, but the, the operative word here is there's sparse or no. So there is a cutoff and we won't get into this too deep detailed, but it's something called an SUVR. And if it's above this binary uh, distinction, then it's a positive scan versus a negative scan. Uh, so I think that's, um, that's something really important to remember. And a positive scan indicates moderate to frequent amyloid neuritic plaques. And that means it's, you know, biomarker proven in the, in the same, in, in, a, in a context of progressive short-term memory loss, of course, uh, that would be a clinical and then, uh, you know, biomarker confirmed uh, diagnosis of, you know, probable uh, Alzheimer's disease. Now the, the confusing part, with amyloid scans is they may sound great to help with our clinical practice, but unfortunately they're not reimbursed. They're very expensive, you know, several thousands of dollars, three to five, five to 6,000, depending on the site. Um, so as Mark alluded to earlier, um, having serum biomarkers um, are really going to hopefully be the future of, of, uh, of early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, that would really be a game changer if we had a one that's really reliable. You know, if you track these biomarkers over time, what you see is it's pretty interesting because uh, a beta protein begins to increase in the cerebral spinal fluid pre-symptomatically. And you can almost get maybe not peak levels, but a significant buildup of beta amyloid protein before you even begin to get symptoms. So amyloid imaging can pick up on it. And this is one way that we can make early diagnoses over time. If you look at changes in terms of uh, functional changes on FDG PET, you look at volumetrics on MRI, in particular hippocampal atrophy, you look at buildup of tau and CSF, you can see that these lag somewhat behind the buildup of amyloid. But this is an important point in this graph. Look at how all of these different changes are unfolding pre-symptomatically through early and late mild cognitive impairment. So you may have individuals who have relatively mild cognitive changes, functionally they're doing well, and yet they have full-blown evidence of amyloid and tau in their brain. So you can see by the time they walk in with a diagnosis of, of actual dementia or Alzheimer's disease, these pathological changes have been going on for years, if not decades. It just speaks to the challenge of early recognition and then finding ways to intervene at that point. Because cognitive changes, functional changes, they're way down the line in terms of of all these pathologic changes. So this, this is a big challenge that we're facing, but at least we appreciate this difference. And we know that the earlier we can identify it, the earlier ultimately we can intervene. And the problem with delayed assessments, uh, you know, I have, I have several family members with Alzheimer's and, you know, I had one family member that even despite my best begging and pleading, it took over four years to receive a formal diagnosis. Um, and there was, uh, you know, that, 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 that impact of, of four years of delay, you know, just the outcomes are just going to be much worse, really, in my opinion. So individuals with cognitive impairment, you know, on average, don't even see a physician for up to two years, and they don't receive a diagnosis for up to one year after. And 20% of people in the US with Alzheimer's never receive a diagnosis, and even when they have a neurologist in the family. So, so these are these are really challenging um, uh, components. And um, I think it's a major problem, you know, like we said, um, you know, if, if we don't have a certain diagnosis, people are going to be misappropriated. They're going to have inappropriate, potentially unsafe treatments. Um, there's going to be delays in treatments, a lack of ability to join a clinical research trial. And, you know, the, the more time that goes by, you know, the, the horse is out of the barn, so to speak, um, the more damage is done. And it, it just becomes so much uh, of a harder disease to treat. And we've both seen cases where guess what? It isn't dementia. There's some other condition. And you think about, uh, you know, all the time someone's been going through unnecessary treatment, unnecessary worry when there's some other condition that needed to be treated. Yeah. So thank you for participating in this module. Uh, please complete the post-activity questions. And we invite you to join us for module three of the series entitled Current Treatment Limitations and Critical Needs in Early Alzheimer's.